I like the name Art of Marriage because a lot of times um, it doesn't look as much like an art as it does maybe a sport. And uh, this is an opportunity to kind of even some of that stuff out. Well, I think we all know that marriage is a journey and, um, you know, when we're on that road of marriage, it, uh, there are potholes. You know, a lot of times we tend to spend our marriage just kind of waiting for the next pothole. And this kind of help you get past a lot of that stuff. So you don't feel like you're going to run off the road every time something happens. A lot of times people will go to the, the things and they'll watch the, these kind of conferences and they'll watch two or three of the sessions and they'll think, you know, none of this stuff applies to me, you know, but five minutes into it, the person next to you busts out crying, you know, and they're like, honey, it's you. And then they kind of get the idea that, you know, it, it's going to get you somewhere. Part of it is going to affect you. So even if you go and you watch a couple of them and they haven't got you yet, they will. So just hang in there and, and get what's available and enjoy and have fun. For Pete and I, um, when we got married, I had a lot of misconceptions about marriage, um, fairy tale expectations. Um, it's all about me perspective, I guess you could say. And um, it wasn't until I asked God to show me what He wanted to change in me that things began to change in our marriage. We're all going to have um, challenges in our marriages, differences about finances and about children. Um, but when I had that godly perspective in my heart, I was able to approach those differences um, differently, that I could be respectful and honoring to Pete, even when we disagreed. We were able to learn that the most important thing in marriage is our personal relationship with the Lord. And, and um, it is all for His glory. Can we say thank you to Pete and Tennyson for doing that? And then they're going to be helping us with the Art of Marriage Conference. And I'm looking forward to that, especially in this new life that God has given to us by design. You realize that? That He has designed your life and it is with a purpose. Uh, part of us getting into you know, relationships and then learning about one another, we have this, this, uh, this thought or this dream that we got to wait for perfect conditions in order to start something. We wait for perfect conditions in order to get married. We wait for perfect conditions in order to uh, make a decision. We wait for perfect conditions in order to date. You know, we wait for those perfect conditions. But what we're going to learn today is there's never going to be a perfect condition before we make a decision. Although that would be great, we live in an imperfect world with imperfect people. So if you're waiting for perfect conditions to start something or to, to get, your, get into this relationship with God, and sometimes we say, well, if once I get my life in order, then I'll attend church. Once my life is in order, then I'll go 100% with God. When I get my act together, then I'll come to God. Well, I'm here to tell you that doesn't happen because we need God in order for us to get our life together. And that's what we want to learn today. We want to learn the journey of learning. Part of learning in this process of life is hearing God's voice. Uh, some time ago, I was praying and I said, Lord, you know, in our, in our culture here at New Hope Hila, Hawaii, you've given us a vision to reach the lost or reach people far from God, one relationship at a time. And you have given us a team to do that. We call them the staff. And part of that team is how God wants to put people together so that we can advance in the kingdom of God. So I would pray and I would say, Lord, then this is your church. This is your team. This is your staff. You do this. You put that team together so that we can accomplish what you're asking of us. So I prayed and I said, Lord, there's, a, there's an area here uh, on our team, on staff, uh, in our church that, that I, I think needs to, uh, we, we got to do something to get us to that place where you want us to be so you show me that person and so I prayed and God sent someone and they volunteered for over a year in that specific position and I was I'm so, I was so thankful I said God thank you for sending that person but then the Lord wanted to expand and he wants to expand us and he wants to take us to another growth area and another area to reach out to more people and one of those areas is uh, what we call online giving. Online giving is where anyone around the world can give to the cause of God here at this church. 
And for many of you, you don't carry, you know, checks or cash. So when it's time to tithe, you don't know what to do. And so we are actually hindering a lot of people from wanting to give to the Lord. So in this one specific area, I said, then Lord, you have to show me this person. And so he did, and I prayed. And then I gave it to our elders and our council members to pray about this one person to join our staff team. And I said, what do you guys think? Pray about it and you let me know. And so they all came back thumbs up. And so the person that I asked to come on staff is Tanya Fong. And so I asked her to pray and her husband Richard. And they said, yes, the Lord said to follow him and obey him. And so they're going to be uh, coming aboard. And so I, I thought, wait a minute. One of the things that I wanted to do is to make sure that because this person is a family member with one of uh, the people on staff, there may be the perception of nepotism. So I took it to the Lord and I said, Lord, you know, I, I believe we heard you about this person, about Tanya, but what about nepotism or people thinking this person is hired because of family? And Jesus quickly said, I dealt with the same thing. And I said, Really? And he says, yeah, one day as I was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, I saw two brothers, Simon, who, who is called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And so I called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed me. Then a little farther up the shore, I saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And I called to them, Come follow me too. And they immediately followed me, leaving the boat and their father behind. And so did you know the first four disciples of Christ were family members? And then later on, Jesus brought me to another scripture in Matthew 20, verse 20. He says, you know, I also dealt with James and John's mother, where she came to me and she said, you know, Jesus, can you have James and John sit on the right and left of you when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, well, uh, do you know what you're asking? Are, are they able to drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? And James and John said, yep, we can. We are. We, we can do this. Not knowing what Christ was going to do. But Jesus dealt with that too. He dealt with family being on his team. And then he said, Sheldon, first of all, it's not your fault that they're family, nor is it Tanya's fault that she has family on staff. Neither is it the person on staff who is family. I created them to be family, not you. And I chose them, not you. And I thought, okay, God, then it's in your hands. I'll leave it up to you. So Tanya Fong will be our resource director assistant. And I just wanted to introduce you to her this morning and her to you. So Tanya, if you could come up this morning. Thank you so much. And we're going to pray over her. That's a big responsibility, and, she, and she'll be part-time, but um, Tanya is just a God-sent, and she's been volunteering in that position for over a year, but we want to expand it. Oh, look at that, a little gift. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so, so we're going to pray for her. If you just stretch a hand forward, and we're going to pray. Lord, we thank you for Tanya and Richard and the life that you have blessed us with. We pray for the future that you have, not just for the two of them, but for this church. You own this church. You're the head of this church. And so what you say, we want to be obedient to you. Help us in this situation that as we continue to move forward and expand, that you would give us the vision and direction in the future that you see for all of us. We trust in you, Lord. We thank you and we, we praise you for this season of our life together with Tanya and Richard, and with the body of Christ. We trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all said amen. Can we say thank you to Tanya? Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome. Yeah. So you can congratulate her afterwards, and so let's jump into our message this morning. You can take out your bulletin and your notes, and we're going to be talking about this journey of learning. How many of you are learning right now? You're still learning in your life. You're learning some things. Yeah, good. Some of you that are not learning, good for you. We, I think we, we're all learning and, and 
we have this assumption that we have to have the perfect conditions before we start something. But the journey of learning says when you start, you'll learn the best way as you go. Because that's how many of us learn. It's like our children, you know, when our children were growing up and they became of age, we said, okay, now you're an adult. But if you're still living here, you can still make your own choices. This was in our house. You can still make your own choices, but just let us know where you are. Because if you're coming home, or you don't tell us what time you're coming home, and you're coming home at 4 o'clock in the morning, I need to know. Because as the man of the house, when you hear someone just kind of creeping in the house, either it's a burglar or it's going to be your children. So I told my kids, if you don't like get lickings in the dark, thinking it, I'm thinking it's a burglar, then let me know what time you're coming home. So there's a responsibility when it comes to the journey of learning. And so as our kids grow up, they learn that responsibility too. And just like us with God, we learn that responsibility with God. We're all in this journey together of learning. Our, our home that we moved into, when we first moved into it, we could have said, well, we need, to, we need to learn everything about the house before we move in. What light switches turn on what lights, what circuit breakers turn off what outlet, we need to know what room is going to be whose before we move in. What the paints will look like, uh, what kind of carpeting, how we're going to decorate inside. We need to know, know all of that first before we move in. Now, if we, if we did that first, we would never move in. However, when we did move in, we had to learn what switch turned on what light. You know, you got to get used to that. And then what circuit breaker turns off what outlet. When you move in, you're on that journey of learning because you're in the home. And it's the same as in our life. We're in life. Once you get married, you're in married. Once you're at your new job, you're in the job and you're learning as you go. So there are a couple things that we're going to learn today. And one of them is from a man by the name of Moses. The other is by the name, a man by the name of Paul. He was called Saul, but then later became Paul. And Moses is in the Old Testament of the Bible, and Paul is in the New Testament of the Bible. But in their life, they're going to teach us some things that, that uh, we all can learn from. That's what the journey of learning is all about. It, it gives you grace for one another. It gives, you, it gives you a scope of where you're heading. But at the same time, it allows us to be okay with us and ourselves as we make mistakes and as we learn, because how many of you, like me, when we make a mistake, we kick ourselves in the head over and over. We just, I mean, we hate making mistakes. And especially if you're a perfectionist and you make a mistake, you're probably more worried about other people, what they're going to say about you, than you're worried about yourself. So in this journey of learning, we can all learn together. Michelangelo, he said, the greater danger for most of us, lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and hitting that mark. See, God doesn't want us to set our aim low. He wants us to set our aim at Him, at the highest place, because He's the one that is with us on this journey. When Moses was leading the people out of Israel, in fact, if you're reading your devotions with us, you're in the book of Exodus, and Moses is learning from God. He's asking questions. He's admitting some faults that he had with God, and, and, and God says, I cannot go with you because you're a stubborn people. You're stiff-necked. And so the people are learning this from Moses. They're watching him meet with God, and, and he giving them instructions, and then they... Uh, learning from God and, and following God as best as they can. And God is saying, I can't go with you because you're a stiff-necked people. You're hard-headed. You're not listening. So if I were to go up in your midst, I'm going to destroy you because you're unchangeable. And so Moses is telling the people, hey, guys, God is leading us, but we're stiff-necked. And God says, if I go with you, it'll kill you because I am a God who has created your life by design. And if you're not willing to change, then I can't go with you. And so Moses and the people had to deal with it. You know, on this journey of learning with God especially, it takes a relationship to learn. It takes a relationship to, to get better and better and better at learning. Because it's in the relationship that you get to know one another. Heidi and I, we've been married for over 21 years, and... 
been together for about 28. So, the other night, for our date night, I said, um, Heidi, for our dinner tonight, you order me whatever you think I want. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, yeah, I'm not going to look at the menu. You order for me, and I will have to eat it. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I hope I was nice to her today. <laughs> so, and, and that's what we did. Someone gave us a, a gift certificate, so we, had, we, 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 could, we could buy some stuff. So the waiter comes over, and Heidi is whispering because she doesn't want me to know, and I don't want to know until the food gets there. But the problem is the waiter is repeating what she's saying. So she, she would say, can I have the steak with this? And then I want that. And I can't hear. So I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. Then he goes, uh, how would you like that steak? And so she goes, uh, medium well. She goes, okay. And then she orders some other things. And then when the food came, she got me uh, clam chowder, which I love. Clam chowder with steak and lobster. I never order steak and lobster because I feel I don't deserve steak and lobster. So she said, you deserve this. And I'm thinking, oh, Heidi, you the best. You is the best. You is the nuclear bomb. So I was so happy. And I thought, that's the journey of learning. But not only did Heidi know what I love to eat, she knew what I did not want to eat. I mean, she went through the menu and she eliminated, nope, 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 yes. See, on this journey of learning, not only will you learn from God instructions and what to do and how to live this new life, you're going to learn what not to do because that is just as important as what to do in this life with God. On the way home, uh, as we're, we're coming to our house, as I'm driving down our road, it's nighttime, but I see this, it looks like a huge cat. And I'm thinking, wow, that cat's not even moving. Usually cats, once they see a car, they move. And it's on the side of the road. Come to find out it's a rabbit. So I'm thinking, wait, rabbits don't just cruise around in Hawaii. This is not like mongoose. You know, mongoose are everywhere. They run, they stop, check you out, and then they leave. But this is a rabbit. It's on the side of the road. So I'm thinking, that has to be someone's rabbit. Maybe they're going to post a lost, you know, sign. So I said, you know, Heidi, I'm going to go catch it, and then maybe we can hold it, and maybe someone would say lost and found. So I get outside, and as I'm approaching the rabbit, it doesn't move at all. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, wait a minute. I remember seeing a, like a movie or something with a rabbit going crazy on some kids. And so it was kind of dangerous. And then I'm thinking, does it have rabies? Do rabbits have rabies? And I'm thinking, does rabies mean rabbit in Spanish? I don't know. So I don't know. I, I'm trying to deal with this. And so I, I go to touch the rabbit, and it bounces away. It, it runs away, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to go near that thing. So I come into the car, and, and Heidi says, so what? I said, I ain't going to catch it. What if it scratches me up and stuff like that? They have sharp claws, so I'm not going to touch it. So it went into the neighbor's yard, and, and so I'm thinking, you know, this doesn't look good as a man. Can't even catch a rabbit. So it goes into the neighbor's yard, and I said, so what, Heidi? You think I should catch it or not? I'm trying to stay manly. And she says, no, it's in the neighbor's yard. I said, yeah, it's in the neighbor's yard. You know. I would, I would grab them, but it's in the neighbor's yard, so maybe it's theirs. And so here's what I learned. Even on this journey of learning, there are going to be times where your past will catch up and will say, don't, because you know what it's like. Or like me at this rabbit, I've seen a movie and I know what can happen. You may have heard of something that Maybe from the Bible or maybe a friend that says, you know, don't, don't go that route. Don't, don't go that direction because it'll turn out bad. Or that is a great decision because that's the Lord's direction. And this journey of learning, very rarely will we get things right. Very rarely. But when we do, we celebrate. But very rarely will we get these things right. So what do we do? Because most of us, we want to say, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to know what you're asking of me in this new life that you've given to me. You've designed my life. What are you saying? Uh, some time ago, someone came up to me and they said, you know, I, I prayed to the Lord that, that uh, if I should do this, and he said, yes, this is what you are to do, but it's not turning out how I planned and how I thought it was going to be. Did I not hear the Lord? Maybe it wasn't the Lord. And I said, you know, it may not be you trying to say, was it you, God, or wasn't it you, God, based on 
your circumstances or your results. God is not a circumstance kind of God. He is a sovereign God. So if you felt that that was the Lord and it turned out it wasn't, it has nothing to do with your decision, but more importantly, of you learning to hear God. That's what's important. Otherwise, if you just keep second guessing, oh, that's not, that's not, that's not, and you never start, move forward, make a decision, or take risks, we'll never learn God's voice. Because it's in that relationship that we get to learn God's voice. And in the beginning, even if God says, you know, this is what you are to do, but then you say, well, I don't think that's you, you will find out in the end more of what God's voice sounds like. That's why this is so incredibly important. The Word of God. It's not called the Word of God for nothing. It's actually what He said, what He is still saying, and what He will say when we get into heaven. It's the same God. He never changes. So if you want to get to know God better, or know His voice better, get into His Word. This is what He is saying. Sometimes we think, well, I can't get into the Word of God, but I'll pray. You can do that, and you can connect with God, but you also have other voices. You have your own voice. You have people's voices. You have your upbringing. You have coworkers, family members. And then the one that we really want to avoid, the devil's voice. He can whisper things into our ears. So we got to be cautious that we, that we don't stray from the word of God. Otherwise, we won't get to know his voice. And then this journey of learning actually stops because we can't learn anymore. And these two people, Moses and Paul, they, they teach us some things. And we're going to learn three key components in the journey of learning, which when applied has the potential to improve every area of life. Here's the first thing we can learn from Moses. That's to admit our faults. You can write that in if you're taking notes. Admit my faults. Because there are some areas in our lives that we learn about what we would never learn about until we begin to admit our faults. There's this thing called self-awareness that you learn your personality type, you learn your, your temperament, your, your talents, you learn your strengths and your weaknesses. That's like self-awareness. But if we don't admit that there are some character flaws that we got to work on, then we stay the same. Or a self-image that we deal with any personal issues that, that pull us backwards. And we have to face reality no matter how much it hurts us. We got to face reality. Then we can be honest with ourselves to, to almost like take a, a, an honest assessment of ourselves to look at our life and say, this is, this is where my life is. I got to make some changes. Lord, can you help me? Because then we can have improvement, self-improvement. From there, we can learn and grow with the Lord that we can make a commitment to grow in our ability to to recognize God when he says, this is the direction I want you to go. And then on that journey, learn his voice, learn what he's saying. And then together with him in this relationship, in that journey, we will see this life that he promised us by design unfold and his promises come to pass. That's where our responsibility comes in. It's like a self-responsibility that we acknowledge that we're responsible for our own actions and attitudes. I think for many of us, we should be at a maturity level that we're done blaming. Done. Pow. Gone. Because if we keep blaming other people, my past, my upbringing, or what so-and-so said or did, if we keep doing that, we never grow. We never improve. We never move forward. We never learn. Because there's always an excuse. There's something that we can blame. And then we keep doing that, but we never change and God says, this journey that you're on, I can't go up with you because you're unwilling to learn. You're unwilling to change. And Moses came to a place where he said, okay, I, I got to admit my faults. In Exodus 34, verse 9, Moses says, oh Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people. But Please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. It's like Moses came to the realization that, wait, I can blame people, I can blame circumstance, but Lord, here's, here's where we're at fault. Yes, we are a stubborn people. Forgive us, but make us your own special people. It's like Moses knew, wait, there's greater things ahead, so enough with the past. God, I'm going to move into the future. Make us your special possession. Yes, we are a stubborn people. I admit that. 
Help us to move forward. Forgive us. See, admitting your fault with God is like withdrawing finances from a wealthy person. All you need to do is show up. He withdraws from his riches and gives that to you. And that's just like with God. We show up with God. Okay, God, here's my faults. Here's, here's where I need help. And God says, I can pour out my riches on you because you understand how much I love you and how much I can help you and that you know where you need to improve. But if we're prideful and stiff-necked, God says, I can't even go up in your midst. I can't even go with you. I liken it to a marriage in this journey. You know, the first year Heidi and I were married, it, it was probably one of the toughest years. You don't really see it at that time. You just think, well, how come we're fighting all the time? Must be her fault. Must be his fault. Must be because of this. And, and partly true, there, are, there, there is truth in that. But that first year, in that first year, if you've been married for that first year, aren't you learning about each other more than anything else? You're like, wow, I didn't know that she was like this or he was like this. And then we say, boy, if I knew they were like this, I don't know if we would have gotten married. But you pass that first year and you persevere with God. And again, this journey of learning, you get to that third year. And for Heidi and I, that third year was almost like, okay, Lord, we got we to gotta, we gotta grow up. We got we, we to gotta get tighter in our marriage. Not with me and all my friends. That's done already. I got to focus on my marriage so that I can have great friends. Otherwise, if I focus on all my friends, my marriage falls apart. Then I go looking for another wife. And then because I'm focusing on my friends, that falls apart. No, I got to focus on my marriage so that I can have great friends. If my friends leave me because I love my wife, they're not my friends. They will say things, and I've heard it all. Oh, ball and chain, I showed him. Ball and chain, what? Cannot surf. Oh, you whipped that, you whipped. That's what they would tell me. And in my head, and with the Lord, I would constantly say, no, nope, I'm just being responsible. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be responsible as a husband, I'm trying to be responsible as a father. And it took time. That was that third year. The seventh year of marriage, this was my phrase. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> so being married more than 21 years, I, come, I came to this conclusion. In, in this journey of learning, especially in marriage, it never ends. You will never come to a place where it is perfect. You'll have perfect moments. You'll have perfect seasons. But it will never stay perfect, just like the weather. As great as Mauna Kea was with all that snow, it comes and goes. We are in a marriage that God has designed perfectly. God designed marriage perfectly. The problem is not marriage. The problem is imperfect people who get married. So on this journey of learning, even in marriage, you continue to persevere with the Lord because He is the reason why we get better and better and better. Not on each other. If we, if we try to change someone else, it doesn't work. If we have a difficult time changing ourselves, why are we trying to change someone else? And God says, when you admit your faults, now I can work with you. I love the Art of Marriage Conference. I love the idea behind it. I am so thankful for Pete and Tennyson for, for being willing to, to cast the vision of this conference. And this is the workbook. And I'm, I was thumbing through it. And you will love this workbook. You know what I love about this workbook? One, get pictures. So as a husband, we're not going to get lost. But you can take notes, and then I can use this as a reference. Love and lead a man's role in marriage. What is a woman's role in marriage? Or this one, uh, that love fades, overcoming isolation, the fallout from the fall. It's in the little things, finding the perfect spouse, what to consider when preparing to confront. It has, it has such great, uh, great subjects to talk about. And then I can always go back to it when Heidi and I scrap. I can say, okay, wait, hang on, Heidi. It's, okay, okay, forgive me. You know, it'll, it'll help as a reference. So you get this wonderful book with the conference. It is a small price to pay. Small price to pay for a marriage to thrive. We spend that kind of money eating dinner. 
and it's gone. But if I can invest in my marriage, boy, that's something that God can build in our lives and change for eternity. It just builds our character. It's, it's just a perfect example of learning. That's, you know, God gives us marriage as a, as a wonderful illustration of our relationship with him. Connecting groups is another way too. It's in connecting groups that we can admit our faults. And that, that meeting is coming up on Saturday. So if you want to lead a connecting group, a small group, Bible study group, uh, a devotional group, or activity group, then please be there on Saturday. It will only help in our relationships, especially the one with God, the most important relationship. And it'll help with our faults. You know, it's, it's easier sometimes for someone else to tell us our faults than our spouse. That, that, is, that is fight all day. But if someone else can he- help keep us accountable, then it helps us to grow in this new life that God has given to us. So that, be willing to admit your faults. And then the second thing is to ask questions. Ask questions. But listen, make sure you're listening, not listen and then you wasn't paying attention and then ask the question that was addressed. It's asking the right questions and paying attention to what God is saying. Did you know that we, we were designed with an innate instinct to ask questions? Have you ever been a, around a five-year-old when you're doing something? Maybe you're fixing something. Uncle, what you doing? Oh, I, I'm, I'm fixing this bike. What happened? Uh, it broke. How come? Uh, so and so, uh, somebody was riding it and they, they, they got into an accident. Oh, what happened? Well, they fell. And is there, are they okay? Yeah, they're okay. So what are you doing? I'm, I'm fixing the bike. But what are you fixing? I'm fixing the paddle. After a while, you're like, you know what? Enough questions. <laughs> Enough. But we're, we're created like that. We're created to ask questions. But that's what happens. At a certain point of life, we stop asking questions. We stop asking questions. Because to us, it, it, it's almost like if you ask questions, that means you're not smart. But asking questions doesn't mean you're not smart. Asking questions mean you still want to learn. That you're willing to grow. You're willing to do the necessary things to get better. Moses asked questions. He, he, said, he said this to, to God in Exodus 33, verse 16. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Moses continuously asked questions. That's the journey of learning, that you're asking questions. When when we went to conferences and when we would go to seminars, they would always have this one guy that would ask questions. And he'd be the first to ask questions. And in the beginning, I thought, how come you always ask questions? Well, you don't know. And then he would ask questions. And some questions I would think, what kind of question was that? What does that have to do with anything? And then I thought, you know what? I'm not going to ask questions. I'll wait to the end so that I can really think through a good question so I sound smart. So I would wait to the end. The problem with that is because everybody else is asking questions, there was no more time for my question. So I'd have to go to the seminar speaker or the conference speaker to ask questions. But if there was a line, I would never get to them. So I never got to ask my question. My journey of learning taught me this. Be the first to ask questions. So when you ask the questions, don't just ask at random. While that person is speaking, write your question. And I'll just write question after question after question. And then they would say, is there any questions? I'd be, yep, I have seven. (laughs) And sometimes they would say, oh, I don't know if we have time for seven. I'd say, well, I'll ask, and then you let me know when we're done. And I would ask my questions. But unless we ask questions, we won't know. We just won't know. When you ask questions, it helps with understanding the end result. Some time ago, uh, one of my friends had a jet ski and he had a a wakeboard, or actually it wasn't a wakeboard, it was like a, I guess a wakeboard, like a smaller surfboard for jet skiing. And everybody was trying and trying and trying, but it was hard to get up. I don't know if you ever tried that. We're at Bayfront, and once the jet ski starts to go, I mean, it is pulling. So I'm watching everyone. I'm asking questions. So how was it? Oh, man, it was hard, you know. You got to hold your legs. You got to pull tight. Then you got to release. So I'm asking everybody questions. And then the person who knows how to do this, I said, okay, what's the trick to this? He said, well, you see how they're not sitting down in the water? They're like getting ready to go. Don't do that. 
you got to sit for a while, and as he's pulling, you're going to feel the pull from the water and the tension, but you have to hang tight and then slowly make your way up and then hang on tight. Don't leave your arm out like this because you're going to fly forward. Hold it tight here so that there's slack. I said, okay, 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 okay. Got it. And then it was my turn. And sure enough, everything he said, I applied, it worked. And we're flying it out toward the break wall. And I'm like, yeah! And then my legs started to burn. And I told the person on the jet ski, I said, hey, turn around. We got to go back in. My legs are burning. He said, oh, okay. So he turned around. And then as we're coming in, I mean, we're flying it. We got to be going like 80 miles an hour. Maybe somewhere around there. We almost went back in time. So I'm, I'm coming to the shore. And he said, okay, I'll go whip you around. And you just go on the shore. I said, what? He said, I'm going to whip you around, and then you're going to go on shore. I said, okay. And I'm thinking, wait, I didn't ask the guy, how do you get off? (laughs) I asked, how do you get on? And so he does. He whips around and goes, here we go. And now when they whip you, you pick up speed. And everybody's on the the shore, yeah, clapping. I'm like, I'm not a pal yet. This is not the end. And I tumbled onto the shore, jumped up, and I was like, woo. I was hurt. I was hurt. But I didn't show it. And I was okay after that. And I thought, I should have asked him, how do I get off this thing? Because the water is like cement. If any of you ever fell from a jet ski, it is like cement. You just skip. And everybody on shore thinks it's fun. Oh, look, I'm skipping. No, they're bouncing. They're bouncing because it's like cement. That's the journey of learning when you ask questions. You're keeping the end in mind. You're not saying, You're not saying, okay, so what do I need to do, Lord, to get married? You're saying, Lord, what do I need to do to stay married? It's not how do I get the job, it's how do I stay hired? You're thinking of the end because in this journey of learning, it continues to go over and over again. You're continuously learning. It's constant. So you're not just thinking of the beginning. You're not saying, Lord, uh, so how do I tithe? It's, Lord, how do I develop the heart to continue to tithe? How do I do that? Because you're thinking of the end in mind, not just the beginning of starting something. See, it's not perfect conditions that should give you the reason to start something, but that you start and then you learn from there. Luke 11, 9, it says, and Jesus said, I I tell you so, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. We teach this principle to our children. You you ask, and you keep asking, but we tell them to ask properly. When they want a cookie, they don't just come up to you and say, I like one cookie. I mean, if they do, what do you say? Yeah, you can say, please. Or with us, I'm Papa, Heidi is Gigi. Gigi, can I have snacks? Gigi, can I have cookie, please? That's what we say. We say, ask properly. Well, that's what happens with us and God, us and this journey of life. This journey of learning, even in our marriages, sometimes we'll do something and then the next day we'll point fingers and say, you know, if you never say that, then I wouldn't have said this. Instead of asking the right question and saying, you know, when we, you know, yesterday, you know, I'm sorry about yesterday. What could have I said? What could have I done that might have helped? And then you learn from that. It also says in John 16, 24, Jesus said, you haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Try attaching the name of Jesus to what you're asking for or what you're asking about or before you ask and why you're asking. Just attach the name of Jesus. It changes everything. It changes everything. It changes why we ask, what we ask for, or, or, or even, even the thought of asking. Once I throw in the name of Jesus, it changes everything. 1 John 3, 22, it says, And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. See, when I attach the name of Jesus, once I put Jesus into the equation, then is my question to please him and, and, my, dis- and my decision, is it to please him or is it a selfish thing? Lord, how am I pleasing you in this decision? In this journey of learning, Lord, I want to please you. I like how Paul well, Saul at that time, he, the question that he gave to Jesus, and he later becomes Paul the apostle in Acts 9, 3 through 6, as he was approaching Damascus on this, on this mission, and his mission was to find Christians and throw them into prison. A light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. 
He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And here's his question. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. See, when you connect with Jesus and he becomes your Lord, like how Saul said, who are you, Lord? It's like there was a shift, a change. And asking Jesus questions may give you answers to do what you don't want to do. If he's your Lord, he may ask you to do things that you don't want to do. And it'll seem like the journey ahead is a difficult one, and it may be, but once you see that it's a journey of learning, then you have more grace, not, on your, not just on yourself, but with other people, because you know that everybody is learning, and you realize when you say, is that you, Lord? And you're seeing Jesus as your Lord, not just your Savior, but as your Lord? Then now you can say, okay, I, I can make these kinds of decisions because it's not my strength, it is yours. You're the one who asked me to do this, so I'm going to follow you in this decision. But here's the key. Number three, stay teachable. Stay teachable. Again, if you make a decision and you say, oh, well, this journey in my life, it's not going right. It's not how I wanted it to be. I didn't know this was going to happen at this stage of life. I didn't know my children were going to be like this when they grew up. I didn't know my spouse was going to be like this or my job or this person. I didn't know my finances was going to be in this condition. I didn't know that this would change in my life. If we stay teachable, then God can continue on this journey with us. Because if we just give up and we are unteachable, then God says, I cannot go up in your midst, but I want to go with you. You just got to be teachable. You can't be stiff-necked. The journey stops once I become unteachable. And this new life that God has given to us by design, that also stops. We'll still live. We'll exist. But the new life by design stops once I, once I become unteachable. Look at how Psalm 27, 11 tells us. It says, teach me how to live. That means we need to learn how to live. Why? Because God gave us this new life and it's by design. So he has to teach us how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Did you catch that? Not only does he need to teach us how to live, the reason why he teaches us how to live is to lead us on this path because there are enemies waiting to get us. Now, not to make you, you know, paranoid or, you know, when you get in your car, where are my enemies? Where are my enemies? Are you my enemy? Who's my enemies? What the Bible is saying is there are things out there that are willing to take you off of this new life by design. There are things to take you away from God's leading. That's why it's important for us to be a part of small groups or Bible study groups. It helps us to stay teachable. Staying teachable is like swimming with the tide. And if you've ever swam with the tide, it's so much easier, less strength, less energy. But your, your, your productivity and, and your speed and your progress is so much greater than if you swam against the tide. Being teachable with God and with people is like swimming with the tide. You exert less energy. Your progress is quicker. And you can see much further ahead. When you're unteachable, it doesn't matter how hard you try you're still in the same place because you're swimming against the tide. And you're thinking, why is life so hard? Because you're trying on your own strength, not by God's strength. We can do all things through Christ who gives us a strength. Exodus 33, verse 5, for the Lord had told Moses to tell them, you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry and fine clothes, clothes while I decide what to do with you. If we're stubborn, God says, uh, if I travel with you, uh, it'll destroy you. Because you're an unchanging people. You're, you're swimming up tide if you're stiff-necked, if you're stubborn. It'll destroy you. You're going to wear yourself out. You're going to become tired and weary all day long because you're struggling with me and against me rather than swimming with me, with the tide. 
because it's going to be his strength, not ours. Stay teachable. I like this uh, scripture in Luke 15, 1. Tax collectors. Now, they were the most despised people. Tax collectors. Now, not nowadays. You, you're just doing your job. But back then, they would take from people more than what was required. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. You know what these people came to do? Listen to Jesus teach. That means they stayed teachable. You know what they didn't do? They weren't there to change Jesus. These people. They came to learn from Jesus. They didn't, they didn't come and say, well, we want to change you. They said, no, we want to change. Teach us. They, they started with themselves. No sense change someone else if you cannot even change yourself. You're with you more than anybody else. And if you can't change that person that you're around with the most, no sense even try with someone you're not even with as much as you are with you. Now, if you're not with you more than anybody else, something's wrong. You need to get yourself checked. <laughs> Here's how Jesus says it. And I love what he says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Three times Jesus says you, and he says your soul. That all happens not from the journey of learning in life, that all happens from the journey of learning in Christ. That makes the difference. Some of you, and I'll, I'll close with this story. Some of you, uh, how many of you ever heard of um, Russell Wilson? Raise your hand, Russell Wilson. I know, he's, okay, it's, he, he's the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, what about Kaepernick? You ever heard of him? Yeah, some of you are 49ers fans. What about Joe Montana? You heard of Joe Montana? Okay, how many of you heard of Joe Montana? Right. Um, what about Marshawn Lynch? Have you heard of Marshawn Lynch? Okay, many of us heard about him. Uh, what about Steve uh, Hauschka? S Steve Hauschka. No? What? Okay, a couple of you know. Okay. Steve Hauschka is the kicker for the Seattle Seahawks. He is the reason why they are in the Super Bowl today. And here's why. It's not because he kicked, the, he kicked the field goal. It's because he didn't kick a field goal. And here's what happened during the championship game where it was fourth down. And fourth down means that's the last down you're going to have in that series unless you make a first down again and then you repeat your series again. It was fourth down and seven yards to go, I believe. So when it's that far, but you're that close to kick a field goal, you go for the field goal. But it was 50-something yards away. They lined up for this field goal, and Steve Hauschka came to the, where he was going to kick. And then he ran off the field because they called a timeout, and he went to his coach, Pete Carroll, and he says, Coach, let's not kick it. He says, why? He said, because the wind conditions are not right. And the coach trusted him. And so the coach said, okay, let's go for it on fourth down. And they made that touchdown, ended up winning the game. That's why they're in the Super Bowl. And I thought, this guy, this field goal kicker, nobody really gave him, gave him credit. Nobody knew what took place on the sideline. Nobody really is patting him on the back. They're going to Marshawn Lynch and say, great touchdown. They're going to the wide receivers and the quarterback. But it's because of that kicker with his journey of learning, wind condition knew that that ball would not go through the uprights he knew and he made the decision and i thought you know in this journey of learning with christ not too many people are going to come to you and pat you on the back and say oh great decision oh you're a great dad you're a great father you're a great mother you're you're a great wife you're you're a great child oh way to go very rarely will people do that but god will god will do that he says, my reward is with me. I will reward you. See, we may not have perfect conditions, but we 
have a perfect God. And that's all the condition we need. It's God. Would you pray with me? We bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have given to us as a gift. We may not have the perfect conditions. Our world may not be perfect. Our life may not be perfect. Our relationships may not be perfect. Even our decisions may not be perfect. But on this journey of learning, you're perfect. And that's all the conditions we need. Help us, Lord, in our admission of faults. And it's not to put ourselves down. It's so that we can learn and grow in those areas. That we would recognize our need for you. That we would ask you the right questions and one another so that we can get better not to point fault and that we would stay teachable because when we stay teachable, we can continue on this journey, not just with you, but with other people. We thank you for this new life that you have given to us. It is by design, Lord, and we are on this journey of learning how to live this new life by design. Thank you for being a perfect God who gives us maybe not the most... uh, in in our life right now in this world, we don't have the perfect conditions, but you give us your perfect love, which changes everything around us. It is only through you, Lord, that we receive these kinds of blessings. Thank you for being a wonderful father. It's in your name that we pray that we all said, amen, amen.